Hey, this is John. Thanks for joining me for this video today. In this video, I'm going to be doing the final steps to finish up the Bandai HGUC RX78-2 Gundam. And you'd think after 12 episodes I'd be able to say that better without having to do it in three takes. But it is what it is. I've gone ahead and put him together so that I can look at the model as a whole and start thinking about any final adjustments I want to make to any of the steps that we've done previously. Um, I, I'll do that at the very end because I have a few more things I want to demonstrate. But I like to assemble it and just start looking to see do I need to add any chipping somewhere that I think it needs it, some additional stains so that it looks more cohesive. You're not necessarily trying to get everything to look the same all around or that there has to be symmetrical staining or symmetrical chipping. But sometimes if you've been doing it separate like I've been doing, you may see that you know one area may have substantially more staining or, than another one or it may look unbalanced or there just may be some things that when you look at it as a whole don't achieve what you're wanting. So putting them together like this towards the end uh, helps visualize that. But for this video I'm going to be covering two things and one in particular. Uh, the one thing in particular I want to be covering a little, with a little more detail is adding uh, dirt effects, earth effects, stains, environmental effects, you know, like mud and dust and things like that. I'm also going to cover a little bit of adding some rust stains, just briefly touch on that, uh, and, uh, and then that will really finish this guy up and we can take a look and see what he looks like at the end. Now before I get started demonstrating technique, I want to talk a little bit about theory, kind of like I did in uh, episode 11 when I talked about fluid streaks and stains. Because I think if you, you understand a little theory of the, the reason you put on certain things and the conditions that would cause them, it makes your application of uh, the various weathering products more profitable. I see so many models, and it's, it's, it's a growth process, so I understand it, but I see so many models where someone's wanting to weather it. Let's say they're wanting to do some dirt effects, and they just kind of smear various things all over the model. Now, if that's what makes you happy, if that's what you like doing, hey, you do it. Um, but if you're thinking critically about it and you're going, well, I, I want to do something, well, I don't necessarily have to be realistic. I want to do something that's plausible, and there is a difference between the two. Um, I think understanding the thinking that goes behind what's plausible uh, will help you in applying your products and distributing them around the model. Now what I'm going to be talking about, of course, can be applied to any model with some, maybe some modifications, but this is going to be specific to Gunpla. Now remember, this guy is 18 meters tall. He's about 65 feet tall. So he's, what's that, the height of like a five-story building or something? It's a pretty big, um, if this were a real object, it's a pretty big object. Now I've got this little figure here, or this little silhouette of a figure. This is actually from a Bandai Star Wars kit in the same scale, 1 1 scale. But you can see how big a man would be next to this guy. So when you're thinking in terms of, of weathering your model, and again, if you're wanting to go for plausibility, uh, if that's one of your goals, you have to think in terms of scale and, and what that would have, uh, how that would affect the application of the products. Now, in terms of putting on uh, some, some earth effects, some mud and some dirt, if he were walking around on Earth, uh, let's say walking in uh, a, a temperate environment, you know, where there's forests, where there may be some ponds, some lakes, um, walking in a city where there may be some, some drainage ponds, um, there may be areas of dirt with mud and all of that. If he's stepping on mud and it's splashing up, it's not going to go much higher than maybe the height of a man. I mean, this is, uh, you know, a huge heavy object. So you dump any huge heavy object into, a, a, you know, even a foot of mud, it's going to splash the mud up very high. 
but we're still talking very high, may not be more than the height of a man. So in terms of where we want to put those earth effects, it's really going to be down here around the lower feet, maybe some here on the lower legs, um, and, and not much higher. Now, one of the things that I do find uh, is interesting to me, at least, um, is if you do put earth effects higher up on uh, a model, it can indicate something happening that's part of the story. Uh, for example, if you had uh, this model and we put it just around the feet right here, but then we put a heavy amount of staining over here on this right side, all the way up, you know, that could indicate that it, it fell over into uh, the mud in, in, you know, a battle or something like that. And so it can tell part of the story. So don't think that any of this I'm saying means, well, you only put it around the feet. You can put it wherever you want. If he kneels down, you know, in a, in a swamp to take a shot at another, you know, another enemy mobile suit, when he stands up, there may be water stains and streaks on the knees and the front parts of the legs. And, you know, it may completely encompass the foot if he's walked through a swampy area that may be this deep. Um, then there may be things all the way up to there. So think in terms of the story of the model and what's happening to it uh, to come up with your kind of plausible scenarios that help guide the weathering. One other thing to factor in when you're doing the weathering on your Gunpla, or again, any model, is what's the environment gonna be? Uh, for example, if, if this guy's in the desert, it's probably going to be more dust than anything. Um, there's going to be, and, and it would be higher up because sandstorms and all could affect the whole model. If it's going to be in a more temperate environment where you're talking about, as I described earlier, you know, uh, ponds and swamps and, you know, drainage fields in urban areas or whatever, the, the dirt may be darker it may be wetter, um, which is going to change the tone of it. You know, you've seen where dirt can get up against a car and uh, mud, and when it's first up there, it may dry fairly dark, or it may be fairly dark, but by the time it dries, it can be a completely different color. And there can be the dried mud on the outside and then still some wet mud on the inside, and you have two different tones going on. So think in terms of the environment you're operating in. Maybe it's operating on Mars. And so everything is kind of red, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, think of the, the environment that it's in. Again, what's the background story for that environment? And that'll help drive your choice of uh, products that you're going to select to use on the model. Now, of course, in order to add dirt effects to any model, you've got to have some sort of dirt effects handy to use. Now, anything that you use for streaking and staining and other kinds of, of applications can be used for this, uh, these, these earth effects. You can use pencils, you can use oils, you can use enamels, you can use acrylic products like I've got here. The, the point that I'm, I'm going to be making is not to necessarily say you have to use these, but you're looking for tones and textures and ultimately what's the final finish going to look like. Now, I like to use generally acrylic products for uh, the earth effects. And the reason I do that, pigments um, give you a certain finish that I don't think any other product can give you. It gives you a dustiness that, that you just can't match with anything else. So pigments have a special place of their own. However, they have some drawbacks in that once you put them on, Unless you do something to seal them, they're going to be able, you're going to be able to rub those off, you know, any time afterwards. It can be years later, they can still rub off. When you do put something over them to seal them, though, it's going to change the tone a little bit. If you put it on to look dusty, it might not look as dusty. Um, if you put it on uh, to be a little clumpy, it might not be as clumpy because whatever you put on is going to be some kind of liquid and that's going to change it a little bit. But I still think they're worth working with 
And especially if you're going to put it up, put it in a display case, and you're never going to touch it, it's fine for them to go on dry. But that's something to keep in mind as you, as you work with them. And as you get experienced with them, uh, you'll understand better how to use them if you're not familiar with working with them. Now, I also like these Vallejo washes. Uh, I, I'm suspecting that what they are is this stuff in some pigment and, and in some binder and uh, thinner uh, is going on here. But the reason I like to use acrylic washes and acrylic paints and acrylic products primarily for uh, the earth effects that I do is because they do leave some tide marks. They do leave uh, some interesting stains that you don't necessarily get with oils or enamels. And while that may not be realistic for some other applications, I think for mud and earth effects, it's perfect because that's how things dry in real life quite often. That, that as, as the, the liquid dries, the solid that's suspended in the liquid moves out towards uh, where there's more of the liquid and starts to concentrate itself. So you start getting those patterns where there may be a ring around a mud stain where it's, it's tinted in the middle, but there's a ring around it from additional uh, dirt drying there. So I think acrylics uh, come into their own here in this kind of uh, uh, staining and streaking uh, with earth effects. So this is what I use, and I often use them in conjunction so that I may use, uh, if I want a little texture, I'll use some of the, the pigments combined with the wash, and I'll put that on, and the wash actually acts as a binder to hold it to the model, as a fixing agent to hold it to the model. Um, the same way with the Tamiya powders. Um, if you put matte coat over it, it's going to change the way it looks just a little bit, but it'll seal it in. Um, but using these in combination, I think gives you a really good result. But again, keeping in mind the scale of what we're doing. So you may not necessarily want a lot of texture in, in your finish. So pigments may not be something that you're, that you're looking for, but they can give you a dusty look that is in scale, which I'll, I'll show you in uh, demonstrating this. Okay, for ease of filming, I'm going to just use the legs separately. Um, normally, I'd be doing this with it together if I were just doing this uh, off camera, because uh, that's just the way I like doing it. But um, for ease of filming, I'll just do it separately. Now, I like to start with whatever dry products I'm going to be using, because working from the theory that dust is going to get higher up on the model. Um, you know, let's say he's walking around and there's splashing of mud, which is going to go up a certain height, but he's also going to be raising up dust if things are dry. That dust is going to go higher up. So I want to apply the dry dust first, and I want to do it higher up. And then as I put on later uh, wet products, they're going to go lower down and they'll serve, they'll cover up some of the dust where they go, but that's okay. And they'll bind some of the dust in, the colors will mix, it'll, it'll, it works out well to do it that way. If you put the wet product on first and then the dry over it, then it can give you a kind of a weird look like there's, there's mud and then there's dust over it. Now, if that's what you're trying to depict, go for it. But generally, in my thinking, if it's an environment where there's going to be the chance of stomping in mud and things like that, the mud is going to be more fresh than the dust, necessarily. So that's the theory I'm working with. And whenever you're working with pigments, I always recommend putting down some kind of paper towel or newspaper or something. This stuff will get all over your modeling desk. And, you, you know, you may say, yeah, but isn't that what that, you know that cutting mat is for, yeah, but it'll smear up and you'll get it on your hands and you'll get it on, you know, six models later. It's easier just to put something down to protect the desk. Now, you can spoon this out and use it from a palette. Um, you can do it that way. I just tend to go, if I'm not going to be mixing colors, I just tend to go right into the bottle and grab some of the pigment. And you can see I've got a fairly good amount of it there. And I'm just going to go in and I'm just going to start 
tapping that on like that and using the brush to just kind of rub it around and get up on the model there and I'll pick it up off of the, uh, the paper towel and I'll pick it up off of the other parts of the model and all I'm doing is just spreading that around like that. That's there's nothing nothing special about it and you can see it it tints the 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 color up higher up on the leg just a little whereas down here it's heavier and you can see the finish that it leaves you can't get that with oils or even with acrylics i mean pigments have a very um a very useful place in weathering the models so uh, they they are not you know i've heard some people poo poo their use because they are very fragile but i think if you learn to work with their strengths and and then uh, mitigate their weaknesses in terms of you know how the, how easy they are to rub off then then they give you a really good uh, a really good finish that that you just can't, like I said, I just don't think you can recreate with anything else. Now you don't have to buy commercially produced um, pigments like this. For years I used uh, just simple chalks that you can get at any craft store and I would just take a sanding stick and kind of grind them up and use those. So, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be this commercially produced one. I just simply started using these because they were available and uh, and convenient. All right, so here you can see how his foot looks. It's dirty, um, like he's been walking around, like it's raised up some dust. It's not uh, pigsty dirty. It's just, okay, he's been walking around and stirred up some dust. So that's how we want it to look. All right, another product that I like using, and I demonstrated this in episode 11, is these Tamiya weathering powders. Um, they're very similar to the Vallejo in that it's, it's simply powders, but the benefit they have is they're a bit sticky. Uh, they're, they're not going to be permanent like paint would be, but they have a bit more grip to them. They stay on a little better but then they don't have the same translucency that, that the, the pure pigments have. Now, I normally don't use these in conjunction, uh, the pigments and the Tamiya powders, but simply for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to add some of this over the top of it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to think, okay, this is heavier dirt and dust. And I just get a, I like using a Q-tip to apply it. And I'm going to apply it lower down because I want this to seem a little different than the dust above. Now notice it's, it's rubbing off some of the dust. But that's okay because I want to establish um, where my later mu uh, pure mud is going to go. But it's giving me its own effect right there. It's tinting things a little bit. You can see how you can see how that's bringing that up, and what that does. Notice what it's doing to the chipping. It's sticking into the chipping, which would fit real world. So this 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 to me a weathering powder um, is it has its benefits of its own, um, and it is a like I said, it's a little stickier. So if you're going to use a single product for dust effects, this may be a good one because it gives you kind of a happy medium between the liquids and the powders. I'm just going to go ahead and put that on in these other places. And I could switch over here to this if I wanted to and get some darker tones in there. Um, you're always going to have a better finish if you use multiple colors for these various steps. Uh, you know, there's, there's not generally one precise color of dirt and mud in any region. Uh, depending on how wet it is and how deep it goes, uh, you know, there may be different different levels of it. But you can switch colors very quickly with this and give you a good depth of finish. 
And there you can see, hopefully if it's in focus, you can see that's starting to look even dirtier. Okay, now I want to move on to the wet effects. I'm going to use this Vallejo model wash, the European dust color. And I've got some in my palette here. And I'm going to use this the same brush that I, I used for the pigments. Um, I didn't even clean it off. Uh, I figured there's no point because we're trying to make it dirty, right? So it may as well be a dirty brush. But what I do is I go in and I just start stippling this on. Um, on the lower part, I go for a heavier coverage so that it's fairly well soaked. Because, again, this is, you know, representing the, the mud, the dirt, the dust that it would step into as it were walking around. So it's okay if we get it up, you know, to that height of a man kind of thing because it's reasonable to think that it would splash up that high from such a big object. And then as I work it, um, after I get it like all the way around the perimeter of the foot, I unload my brush and I just start wicking up some of the extra. That way it gives me a little more control over what I'm doing. That's, that's one of the key processes to any weathering, is you want to do things in such a way that you control the process. Um, it can be hard for people to learn the weathering process because so much of the time, if you're not careful, you can lose control of the process. And when you lose control of the process, the process has you. Um, and when that happens, you, you know, you can feel it can be very frustrating because you want to achieve an end, but you're not able to get to it because you're not in control of it. But generally, it's best to work in smaller amounts, tighter areas, and have a recovery plan in mind if things go wrong. Now, you see, as I've been rambling on, I just kind of kept working it all the way around. And I'm spreading it around. It's going to mix with some of those previous things. It's going to do its own, do its own thing there. You're going to get some nice results as things mix. And then as this begins to dry, those very tide marks that are often a problem with acrylics and other areas, I think they sell mud and dirt much better. And it's also fixing the pigments that are down there on that lower foot. So it's, it's accomplishing several things for us. So I'm going to give this just a couple of minutes to dry, and then I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, that's mostly dry, and you can see what the combination of all three of those does on the model. You can see the tide marks that are left behind by the acrylic wash, and to me, that looks like, okay, mud has splashed up that far and then dried up. I, you know, I... I some people may not agree with me, but I think that sells the notion of what we're trying to accomplish here. Now, if for some reason you thought the tide mark was a little too much, if you wait until it's just barely dry, and I'm talking like within just a few seconds of being dry, maybe just a couple of minutes, you can go back in and gently blend that edge out a little bit with some water. It's not going to be quite as... Um, effective as oils and when it when it dries you may still get a little bit of a tide mark but you can play with that now if you're not happy with the opacity maybe you want it to be more opaque you want it to be dirtier well you just go back in and with this dry you do the process again maybe you want to do uh, a darker staining lower on the foot to indicate even more mud right there you could even come in and um, I'll just use what's on the, the, the paper towel here. You could even come in and pick up some pigments and add texture to the model like that. So it's, it really is, just as with so much of the other weathering, a process of layering up the products to give depth of finish. Because you could, you could put any one of these products on here, a single application, and it might not sell what you're looking for. And by sell, I mean, you know, the, the viewer looks at it and buys it. They go, yeah, okay, that appears like mud to me. But if you use some multiple colors and uh, multiple products to, to really put on 
uh, enough stuff to give you a depth of finish, then between that and the chipping and all of the other things we've done across the course of building this model, it all comes together to give you a really great uh, deep look to the finish of the model. And I'm just going to talk just briefly, if I can ever talk briefly about anything, about rust stains. Um, in canon and lore, this would not have rust on it, so I'm, I'm not going to apply any. But the process of putting on rust colors in terms of the process is no different than uh, the streaks and the stains we've done where you're putting in very precise um, spots of color and then putting additional colors around it to make the notion of rust. Now where you want to generally uh, put this, if you are going to put rust on your model, is you're going to want to put it where there's chipping because the underlying theory is if, if something rusts it's going to be the underlying material and where it would rust is where the paint or outer finish was chipped. If you've ever looked at a bulldozer or any piece of industrial equipment, you see that. So you're going to want to pick an area where there's a chip and maybe when you're doing your chipping you even do some areas that are larger where you know, okay, I want to really show off the rust there. And what you'll do is I like to work with at least two colors when I'm doing the rusting. For example, I may start off with uh, a dark rust color, this, this Vallejo wash uh, is an example, and then once it dries, I'll spread out a little further from that with this light rust color, because you want the rust to generally be darker in the middle, and then as it goes out from that, as it radiates out from that, or as it streaks down, you're going to want the lighter colors. Uh, I also like to use thinned acrylic paints. So I've got this rust set from, uh, again, from Vallejo, and you've got this yellow, uh, yellow ochre, the orange rust, and then uh, a light rust. And I'll use these in conjunction, uh, starting with this darker color, and the set actually has more colors than this. Starting with this darker color, I'll just dot that over some chipping, and then I'll go in and I'll put this around it um, in just uh, very thin layers uh, around that darker stuff. And then I may use this orange rust to begin a little bit of streaking, and then this yellow ochre will continue that, that effect around the outside or will be further streaked. So by using all of these colors, you're going to sell uh, the notion of rust. Now you can do the exact same thing with enamels and oils. It doesn't have to be acrylics. Um, enamels and oils have their benefit, uh, kind of like with the stains and streaking, where you have more working time. You can blend them better. Uh, so so use, try and use acrylics, oils, and enamels and see which ones you like. I tend to go with acrylics simply because they dry faster. Um, I work at a fairly decent pace so that I can keep these videos up and having things that dry a little faster is beneficial to me. So I tend to go more for acrylics, but if I'm really needing to do some, some really good looking rust stains, um, I will often start with a base of acrylics, but then finish it with oils over the top because I've got a lot more uh, control and can blend those a lot better. But the key to, to rust, multiple colors in, in fairly, uh, you know, fairly tight application that, that doesn't spread out too much unless you've just got something, you know, maybe you're building uh, a Zaku that you want to have that looks like it's been sitting out for a hundred years. Okay, maybe you've got just tons of rust on that thing. Uh, but generally, it's going to be fairly tight, focused around chips or where bolt heads are or things like that, and you'll get some pretty nice uh, rust tones. Now, another simple technique that you can do, I like to do this as the last step of my earth effects, um, but it can be done anywhere in the process, is I like to thin my washes. And again, this can be done with oils or enamels too that are thinned, but I, I like the way the acrylics look when they dry for this kind of thing. I thin it 
with equal parts water, or I, I use equal parts water to thin or to the wash. And I get some on my brush and I get a toothpick. Let me move this here in focus. I get a toothpick and I flick the brush against the toothpick until I get off the big drops. And then I start getting those little spot patterns and I just start flicking that on. And I'll flick that a little higher up sometimes. And I just go around and do this around the lower part of the feet or anywhere that you want to sell the notion of splashes of mud. Now, the great part about this is you can do this. It doesn't have to be confined to dirt and earth effects. You can do this um, with a gray color to do a lot of random chipping across a model. You can do it with minor variations of the base color to produce um, tonal variety across the model. So there's, there's a lot of things that this, this uh, splattering can do. It can, you can even do it with um, some I've seen modelers do it with rust tones and then go in and blend it around the model um, just to put up random tones and you can do this as heavy or as light as you want. I did it kind of heavy more for uh, the sake of showing it than anything but you can see the effect that that leaves you with and as that dries it's really gonna sell the notion of mud Okay, I've got the legs reapplied to the model, and I've got those dirt effects on there, and you can see how that looks there. Now, on this side, I deliberately made a little more of a heavy streak straight up the side of that model, just to show, okay, there's, just, just as with, I talked about in the previous, one of the previous episodes, every chip Every, street, every oil streak or every stain has a story. So does every mud splatter. Um, for whatever reason, this splashed up on that side more than on this side, and that's okay. Um, you'll see that there's a little more over here than there is over here. That helps sell the plausibility of it. Again, realism and plausibility are two different things. Um, I like to go for plausible rather than um, necessarily uh, realism. But those, those dirt effects, uh, I think, really help finish off and sell the model. Now, one, one aspect I forgot to mention uh, that I'll briefly touch on, you can use an airbrush for this. Um, I've done that a lot where I use a color like, to me, a deck tan, and I heavily thin it with alcohol and I lightly spray that on and that can often be a great way of providing a foundation of just basic dust effects on a model um, and you can it's really controllable it doesn't give you the splattering look or any of these other things that that the acrylics bring but it gives a good foundation you can use it as a good tint or just maybe just an overall uh, streaking on your model to just indicate dust streaks so Basically, anything that can apply some kind of earth tones is going to work for uh, adding your environmental effects uh, to, to the model. All right, as I'd mentioned earlier, the, the last step I'll do now that I have all of the, the things in place that I wanted to get there is I'll simply go over the model and decide if I want to add any more chips if maybe I want to cover some up with some paint, do I want to add any more streaks or stains? Do I want to add any more uh, earth tones? Do I need to touch up the paint anywhere? You know, when you're handling these uh, over a long period of time, you can rub paint off. I use lacquer paints, um, if I recall correctly, uh, for this. It's been so long now I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure I use lacquers. And they're, they're pretty durable, so um, it should be good to go there. But... I just give the, the model a once over and see if I want to adjust anything. Now, I've been looking at this one for so long, I'm not seeing anything that I want to adjust. Um, I kind of like it the way it is. Uh, but off camera, I'll look at it a little closer with my Optivisor on 
and uh, you know I may make a few adjustments but when I'm done with that I'll set it up and we'll take some looks with the camera and see what he's he looks like finished all right well I think I am going to call this video and this series done high grade RX 78-2 is looking pretty good it's not necessarily anime correct, but I think to demonstrate various techniques for chipping and fluid stains and post-shading and pre-shading and all the other things that we've looked at over the last 12 episodes, I think, it, I think it demonstrates what you can do with those. And it certainly is um, more on the realistic side of interpretation as if this were a real, real fighting suit. But it ultimately, in the end, whatever you think your Gunpla should look like is how I would encourage you to do it. You can apply as few or as many of these techniques as I've shown. The different materials, you can apply it in greater amounts, lesser amounts. Um, and all of these are just building blocks to put one over the other because the more of these techniques that you layer up, the more depth of finish you're going to get, the more, um, the, basically, I think, the more impressive it's going to look. So um, use these as tools in a toolkit. They're not necessarily something you apply every time and in every situation, but they're simply tools to try and get to whatever the vision is you have in your head of what the model should look like in the end. Of course, it wouldn't be gunpla if you didn't put him in some poses um, and have some fun in that way. One thing to keep in mind though when you've done uh, a lot of painting and weathering and you know putting all of these finishing products on that that we've done through this series the more you handle your gunpla even with a good top coat on it uh, right now this doesn't have any kind of top coat on it. I, I've Often I don't use a top coat. Um, if I put this up for sale, I'll probably put some kind of top coat on it. But if I'm just going to leave it here on my shelf, I quite often don't because I don't handle it that much. But once you start handling it a lot, um, quite often it can lead to uh, some, of the, some of the paint rubbing off or some of the weathering or other effects rubbing off. So do be aware of that, that that the more you add to it, um, you may need to put a fairly, a fairly good top coat on it, whether it's clear or rather matte or satin or, or gloss is not really, uh, that's up to you. But it, it can, um, when you handle it, it can uh, uh, degrade the finish of it. And the more you articulate it, the more you have a chance for paint to scrape from uh, various parts. So just keep that in mind uh, when you're uh, over the life of your gunpla and the way you display it and handle it. A simple step you can take to, uh, to mitigate some of the, the wear and tear on the model is if you put, uh, for instance, if you put one of the beam saber handles in the holding hand and just leave it there don't take it out. You're not having to pull the hand apart. You're not having to uh, mess with the beam saber handle. So you can simply swap out uh, the hands uh, when you want to put it in different poses. Another example is you can take the gun holding hand with the trigger finger and just leave it on the gun like that. And, and then if you're wanting to display it without anything in the hands, then you can just use these as I call them, the jazz hands, um, the expressive hands, and that can help uh, minimize some of the potential damage uh, from from handling it too much. Also, if if you are going to be handling it uh, with some frequency, or when you just want to put it in a different pose, if you just get some simple cotton gloves, um, that can help minimize uh, potentially rubbing off some of the finish. Um, getting the oils from your hands on it. So there's ways of doing that if you're going to be handling it long term, certainly. All right, just for a bit of silly fun, um, let me introduce you to Rusty. Uh, this this Gunpla on the left is actually, especially early on before I had started painting and weathering, 
Um, I'd actually been using two kits to do a lot of the demonstrations, which allowed me to work a little faster. And so throughout this process, in the thumbnails on YouTube and just some other places in filming and, and uh, doing that, I've actually been using a stunt double, as I've called him, Rusty the Stunt Double. So uh, in just a bit of, like I said, a bit of silly fun, um, I'll introduce you to him here before we close out the series. Well, thank you so much for watching not only this video, but if you've been following the series, thank you for, for doing that. Um, and if you haven't, if you're just catching this video uh, for the first time, uh, be sure and look in the description below. There's, there's a link to all of the, the series. There's 12 episodes total, which takes you from uh, pulling the kit out of the box and clipping the parts off the sprues all the way through to this final uh, finish. So take a look at that, and hopefully you can find something helpful uh, somewhere along in there that will uh, improve uh, your, your enjoyment of building your gun plug. I'd also like to thank everyone who follows me on social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks for doing so. I really appreciate that. And there's also links down below, down there in the description, um, for a Patreon. I do have a Patreon account, so if you uh, like what you see and you would like to help me out in continuing to do these videos and these models, then please uh, take a look at what I offer on Patreon and consider supporting me there, and I would be most grateful for that. And certainly, if you're already a Patreon supporter, thank you so very much. Um, big, big thumbs up <laughs> for, for that. Um, I couldn't do what I do without you, so uh, thank you for all of those who have come alongside, uh, especially during times like this, that, that uh, it may not, where every dollar counts, um, but I appreciate you sticking with me uh, through all of it. I, I am most grateful my family and I are. Well, as always, I'll leave you with a closing thought. If you're not having fun in this hobby, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.